Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Dirty Laundry. I'm filming in a different location today. I'm in my living room because my partner has a race today. Um, don't remember the name of the series. Uh, I'll edit the name in somewhere on the screen. Um, and I'm actually going to include a link to his team's Facebook Facebook page and my partner's Twitch channel in the description below. <clears throat> so if you're interested in sim racing or you're interested in normal real life racing and you think you might like to check out what sim racing is all about, take a look at my partner's channel and see whether you like it or not. So today's episode is one that makes me incredibly anxious because um, I don't, I don't like to say that I've been oppressed by societal standards when it comes to talking about abuse, but I'm still affected all the same. And so I still find it very uncomfortable to talk about abuse. And in fact, it took me years to actually get my mum to understand that I had been abused. Um, and so today I'm just going, I'm not going to be talking directly about my abuse. I think I probably need a few more episodes and I might, I might need to record it a few different times to just get through it. And so <clears throat> I want to bring in a new set of words. I know last week we went over what, why, how. In regards to anxiety these ones are who why how <clears throat> and obviously that that might be immediately understandable um, but I know there are some people who might not totally understand how to I guess relate those to themselves especially those people who are only newly realizing the way that they are being or have been treated in the past <clears throat> and so really it's the who has been abusing you the why they have been abusing you and the how they have been abusing you <clears throat> so I'll start with the middle one there because it might seem like the strangest one to some people <clears throat> The why can be incredibly confusing and you might never know and that's okay you know it's all right to never know and it's all right to not want to know why because even if we have a why as to why that person has abused us um, it's never going to be an excuse it may be an explanation for their behavior but it will never be an excuse and you will never ever have to feel obligated to forgive that person because their why might be incredibly sad or I don't know whatever if you feel sympathy for them in any way um, for my abusers not so much um, and yes you know some people have more than one abuser um, sometimes it might happen at the same time sometimes it might happen you know concurrently one after the other um, like it did in in my case and so I just want to pose you some questions this episode um, and I'm sorry if I'm saying um more than often I'm sorry if I'm a bit rambly I'm going to try and edit this as best I can without it being too choppy so my first question to you the viewer um, is, is it still happening? Is it still happening to you? Is it still happening to someone you know? Um, and then <clears throat> I think my, my best, I want to say advice, but I also want to point out that I'm, you know, I'm not trained in psychology or anything like that. And as I said in my last few episodes or la last episode, um, it can also be very hard for trained professionals to truly understand what it's actually like 
they might have all the technical language in the world to describe what anxiety is or to describe what Stockholm Syndrome is and all that kind of stuff but they will never really know unless they've been through it what it feels like and the way in which we deal with those things. So in saying that my my advice as a abuse victim and survivor <clears throat> is you need to tell somebody. Um, now abuse is quite serious it can range from being psychological to being physical um, and sexual and those things can be incredibly hard to talk about and I think out of those three um, psychological can be probably the hardest because there's no physical evidence there's no physical evidence that we can go to a doctor and say, okay, here it is. We can't go to a police station and show bruises to somebody. And so when it comes to psychological abuse, it can be very scary and lonely. Um, it's very easy to feel as though you're trapped, as though you can't talk about it. But it's really important to tell somebody if you're in the position to, you you should probably start off with a local GP. If you have a doctor that you can go to by yourself without your abuser knowing, um, or if you can get whoever you know that is being abused to a doctor without their abuser knowing, um, do so. You need to you need to be telling someone with authority. Um, and I know that might seem very scary to say that another person has authority over you or someone you love but at the end of the day these people are there to help us um, and they might not all understand not all doctors will understand what you're going through but they will have a colleague they will have a boss um, and they will have their very basic training for them to know how to go about getting you help and that can be as simple as suggesting you contact the police if you already haven't it can also be getting the police involved themselves and when I say this I don't want you to get really upset and I don't want you to immediately think that you have to have police involved and that the police have to go straight to your house and arrest whoever it is because that that doesn't always work that most of the time probably won't even happen but in order just to have that on file because no matter what it is the police are gonna have that somewhere in their system they're gonna have such and such has come here and this is what they've said you know so as daunting as it may seem the more of a paper trail that you give to people and that you help provide um, the less alone you actually are <clears throat> because people know people have heard you people have seen you people will have listened to what you've had to say and it will be on record somewhere somewhere that is confidential and safe and so then um the second point kind of was sort of answered in there but also not it's it's can you tell somebody um and unfortunately the the dire truth of this is that the people who are at a point where they can't tell somebody um, they probably won't even have the opportunity to watch this video um, those are the people who are probably incredibly downtrodden they're probably incredibly controlled they've been cut off from their family and friends um, and they probably have no one to talk to other than their abuser and depending where they are in the abuse cycle they may have grown complacent um, with it or they may have developed a means of survival whether that is dissociation or whether they have developed a personality disorder in order to make themselves feel better about the abuse that's happening and so whether they can or not is irrelevant.
but if you can I would suggest doing it it's far better to be a little embarrassed it's far better to have to fight a little bit harder while you can rather than get to a point where you can't do anything where your life is in too much danger or you're psychologically unable to help yourself any longer um, it's always always better to try and sell somebody and then of course this one also ties in is have you reached out to professionals and that yes that can include police and your GP but something else you can talk to your GP about is um, seeing an actual counsellor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist. You don't have to go around, around seeing a psychologist or psychiatrist straight away. If you're not comfortable about starting on any kind of drugs, which is what you would see a psychiatrist for, or if you're not wanting to have your whole world psychoanalyzed, you don't need to see a psychologist. And even if you do see either of those two, you have every right to say to them, look, I would like to have your services, but these are the things I don't want to talk about and these are the things I do want to talk about. And you can do the same <clears throat> whether you see a psychologist, psychiatrist, or just a counsellor. Um, now obviously those people are going to have different specialisations, they're going to have different knowledge. Psychiatrist is going to know everything a psychologist does, but they're also going to be um, learned in drugs, what drugs are good for what um, <clears throat> illness you have. <clears throat> in my case I saw a psychiatrist who was able to give me uh, medication to help with my anxiety, <clears throat> but that was also specifically for people with OCD and uh, heightened anxieties like social anxieties and uh, anxieties that prevent you from leaving the house and so I have those and they help a fair bit I think I probably need to go on a higher dosage at some point because my OCD has actually become worse and I've started to self mutilate um, my toes which I know that sounds very strange it's a very strange place to to start doing but you know I there's got, been a few times where I've picked the skin off my toes right down to the the me uh, metal. <laughs> yes, I'm Wolverine. <laughs> no, right down to the muscle. You know, and it's I, it's hurts. It hurts, but there's something in my brain where you know I I just I can't stop myself. It takes a lot of self discipline to stop myself. <clears throat> and OCD is actually a trait that. I have developed. I'm sure I might have had little bits here and there when I was younger, but that's more just having been organized, I guess. But it's, you know, it's developed into full-blown OCD as I've gotten older and as I've actually um, come to terms or started coming to terms with my abuse and actually talking to people about it. Um, and I guess it started it as a coping mechanism, really. So, you can always do that. See a psychiatrist or a psychologist. And now there's a counsellor and they are just someone, they don't have a PhD in anything. They don't have a doctorate. And they do, I guess they do a, a lot of the same things. The person I've been seeing most recently, and I don't think I've seen him in a little over, over a year, maybe a little under a year now, because I haven't felt like I've had to. But um, he's just a counsellor. He has um, quite a bit of knowledge and he's actually gone out of his way to, to learn more because I first went to him because I really wanted to talk about my agoraphobia and I really wanted to talk about my social anxiety and um, the autism. And you know, he went out of his way to find um, some tests for autism. Um, nothing that would be official, officially documented in like any medical files or anything like that like I'm sure that in, in my files with him and my doctor will have copies but what I mean by that is that um, they're not I guess government bound I suppose uh, like I can't take them to Centrelink uh, which is a government help program over here for underprivileged folk and say hey I, I would like to apply for disability pension um, which I should be on, I should, um, but the test that I need to get done is $500 and 
let's face it, when you're sick, you can't leave the house and you don't have a job and you're working with just a one person income that's impossible like that's an impossible situation to be put in so if you're being told by any of these people you're going to see that you should have this test done and you should have that done and you can't afford to have those done you can say again I think about it don't or you know I don't think I can afford it or it's gonna have to wait till I can afford it and you know you don't have to have them done at all that's something my counselor said you know that there is no need for me to get that big test done because it's going to tell me what I already know and it's gonna tell me there's gonna be nothing new about it um, it's it might tell me the way my eyes move I know the way my eyes move. I know I have trouble looking at people the way other people look at each other. Like I struggle with eye contact. I struggle with facial expressions. I don't understand body language all that well. I'm getting better. I'm definitely getting better. But I'm not at the same place as other people my age are. Like I just, I have no idea. You know, I, I, I just don't get it. I don't understand how people have learned that. And you know, I know those things. So there's no need for me to waste my money unless I needed to get that government help and while yes it would be great to have that government help I've given up it's actually something that is too anxiety inducing for me the process is too hard um, which again is is something that is pretty disgusting frankly it's pretty wrong um, and again if you feel as though that is something you can get through then do it like if you feel you need that support and you need that support to live um, you know if that is something your country your state wherever you are if your government offers that help um, take advantage of it don't feel bad don't feel as though you're some kind of doll bludger because you're not you have an actual illness it's like someone who has no legs and no arms you can't really expect that person to go get a job as a bricklayer. It's just not going to happen, you know. It's, it's like that. If your brain is broken, you're not going to be able to do the same things as a fully abled person with completely working mental capacity. It's just not going to happen. So you can do that. I know I went on a bit of a rant then, um, but as I said, these topics make me incredibly anxious. It's very hard for me to talk about and I'm not sure when I'm going to be able to get into my abuse. So that's it really. Um, counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, there's a difference. Psychologists and psychiatrists have access to get you those high-end tests and things like that and they'll have more knowledge about <coughs> um, specific disorders but counsellors are always an option and counsellors can be a lot more casual um, cheaper for one much cheaper <laughs> and with any three of those people you can tell them what you want to know if they start asking questions that you don't want to answer and they refuse to give up or if they um, I guess scold you or make you feel as though you're doing something wrong you don't have to continue seeing that person if it takes you 10 doctors to get to the right doctor or in a counselor's case counselor um, it takes that amount of people it, it, you know it took me a lot of doctors a lot of counselors a lot of GPs to find people that actually did what I needed them to do not what they thought I needed <clears throat> because at the end of the day a doctor only has medical knowledge and I know that seems like a really loaded statement but it's true they only have medical knowledge they don't know you and even if they're your lifetime family doctor the only person who knows you is you and you need to be really strong and really drill that into yourself because you have every right to ask for the help that you want and on that heavy note I'm gonna say goodbye so thank you very much guys 
this has been another episode of dirty laundry and i will see you guys next week bye